mountains, gonna walk it out and move mountains. When the silent isn't quieter, and it feels like it's getting hard to breathe, and I know you feel like dying, but I promise we'll take the world to its feet and our eyes up. The day I rise up, I rise unafraid, I rise up, I'll do it a thousand times again, and I rise up, rise up. We're at UCH, Cancer Centre, and I'm in the Apris unit having a red cell exchange. Why and are I, you doing that? Because um, I have sickle cell. Um, so I need regular um, uh, red cell exchanges. They take off some of my blood and they give me an equal amount of uh, donor blood. Sickle cell is a genetic disorder that you're born with, and I have the most severe form of it, which is sickle cell SS. I started having uh, blood transfusions regularly when I was about 16. Um, and then a few years ago, when this building was built, we moved over to having exchanges rather than transfusions. Because the problem with transfusions is that you also build up iron overload and you can build up in your vital organs, in your heart, in your lungs, your eyes, and cause severe problems. If sickle cell were a person, you would be convicted of war causing organ damage, organ failure. But the main thing that most people associate with sickle cell is the intense pain. Mm -hmm. I'm always in pain, so I take morphine daily. When someone says you're having a sickle cell crisis, it means that the amount of sickle in your blood compared to the healthy blood is higher, um, and you're in so much pain that you need to be hospitalised. I've spent more of my life in hospital than I have out, and I think and I, I hold an unusual record in this hospital of spending two years and eight months as an inpatient. I also spent four months of it in intensive care, and I ended up paralysed from C2 paralysis. Um, I also had um, severe leg ulcers at this time. So everything from spill of the knee to the soles of my feet, all the skin, most of the flesh, down to the bone had gone. My daughter, up until she was about six, seven, didn't actually realise I lived with her. Right. So I spent so much time with her. She was, she, obviously she knew I was, but thought I lived here. But for eight years, it's been a lot better. Mm -hmm. Ever since I started the exchange program, it's not managed yet to that point where I need to be admitted too often. Mm -hmm. So, in the last say, eight years, I've only been admitted twice. Yeah, UCH has kept me alive. It's been more than a few times where this body uh, and fate has just pushed its luck and, um, and tried really hard to sort of end my life, as it were. Uh, and I'm still here because of UCH. And because of some of the incredible people that work here. This particular exchange has been brought forward. A week early. So I would have had mine next week. Yeah. It's been brought forward because I'm also flying uh, to Las Vegas to sing with the Be Positive Choir. An amazing choir set originally to raise awareness of blood donation and to increase the number of people that donated blood. I applied and went to an audition and got some. And so I've been with the choir from day one. Soon after we started, we, we were asked to appear on the mobile awards with featured artist Lorena Cater. And then we did a Windrush celebration event, which went really well as well. Some suggested, why don't we apply for a Bridge Got Talent? So, and then we did audition and got through and made it to the final. And when you sing in front of a live audience that big, it was like an unbelievable experience. The sound wave of that many people suddenly cheering and roaring at once. Well, you actually felt it. It was palpable. And so even though we didn't win, we got through to finals and I think we finished fourth. And then from then, we've just been going. And 
we got to do some amazing new song for the royal family. A lot of times it was Commonwealth celebrations in Westwood Abbey. We went to Vegas, we've been to Denmark, sunny Boston. And prior to the choir, I'd never traveled. We've been anywhere. They've been on the plane. Yeah. I'm living my best life, I think. I had a bucket list, it's definitely been ticked off. Definitely. I want us to be huge because one of the biggest compliments you ever get paid is not. It's not that when people see you and they say, oh, you're in B positive, oh, you guys go to, no, you're in B positive. I didn't know anything about Simpson before, now I do. Or I went and found out about it. Just by singing, you've, got, you've had that kind of influence to change people and to sort of open, people, open people's minds and say, okay, how is something that affects so many people managed to go under the radar for so long? Growing up, you know, even as 14, coming here, with all the people that came here with them, we're almost three. There's only two of us that are still late. Yeah. How many more? It's a lot. I mean, the year I joined the choir, that year I went to 18 funerals. Hello, young lady. This is the chair, the big chair. It exists because I hate being in bed. Having spent an inordinate amount of time in bed, in hospital beds in particular. Who provided it? HCC. Who? HCC. Um, Hematology cancer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the machine that is changing Calvin's blood? Yep, yeah, that's also one that was funded from HCC donations. HCC. The fact that it's a charity that helps um, all red cell patients um, by training staff. Um, providing machinery, support, and the fact that they raise a huge amount of money to help others. The best way to support HCC is one, if you're on social media, and they have social media pages on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Go there and see what they do, the work that they do. Share what they do to other people. Then volunteer to fundraise, whether it be running the marathon, picking up rubbish, whatever, anything just getting involved, coming and joining us at events. Uh, you don't have to run a marathon or a 10K. You can come along and cheer along the runners who are doing it to help us spread awareness about what the hematology uh, unit is able to do here, which is amazing. I've always had the attitude, if someone tells me I can't do something, <coughs> it's almost like a road wreck to a ball. You're guaranteed that I will do it. Um, I've done some pretty stupid things. I've run half a marathon. Because I was told I couldn't do it. So. What was the result of that? I ended up in hospital. In fact, I ended up, well, the marathon ended up in intensive care. Well, they were right to tell you, really. Oh, absolutely. So I'm not saying they weren't right. Yeah. I'm, they're absolutely right. You know, I'm going to be sick no matter what. If I stayed at home and lived like a monk, didn't do anything, wrapped myself up in cotton wool with bubble wrap on, I'd still be unwell. I never want to be, you know, I told my children, I'd never be one of those people that could have, should have, would have. Do it. Thank you very much for that, Calvin. You can unshare. Now, that just brought back a lot of memories. I don't know if you've probably noticed my top saying be positive. Um, known Calvin for a long while now as part of the choir because my wife also has sickle cell. And just dealing with him in seeing the, the brightness that he brings with so much pain. And, and we'll explain more as I ask him the questions and we go for exactly how he's living with this debilitating condition. It kind of brings tears to my eyes because I think about the times that he is in pain when we're singing, when we're rehearsing, he's in pain, but nobody would know that because it's called that hidden pain. So we're going to bring out that hidden pain in today's uh, interview with Calvin. Um, he's done so much. I'm not going to go into kind of going through everything that he's done because that will come out in the interview. But I just want you to listen. At the end, we'll have a chance to ask questions if you need to in regards to that. OK. All right. So 
Kelvin, welcome, sir. I know you're a campaigner and you do a lot when it comes to raising the awareness of sickle cell and there is so much more to do, okay? But first, I just want to take you back a little bit. I want to take you to your childhood days. I mean, just if you can, if you can go into when you were first diagnosed with it, that will be helpful too. Okay. Um, I was first diagnosed with sickle cell at the age of six months old at Great Ormond Street Hospital. And back then, uh, very little, if anything, was no much uh, about sickle cell and what it was and, and the effect it had. Um, so quite often, children would uh, would suffer and die in childhood because they wouldn't, because the doctors just simply didn't know what it was. And I was fortunate that I went to Great Ormond Street and the doctor that was treating me at the time, I actually still remember his name, Dr. Cohen, uh, diagnosed me in six months because I was always crying and obviously in pain. So six months old, I had been in pain every single day of my life. Um, and it's just, it's just one of those things, it's like breathing, it's there. So I have to deal with it and do it as best I can. I understand, I understand you can't be diagnosed as a newborn child. No, so, so because yeah. prior to six, six months old, you have too much fetal hemoglobin. So fetal hemoglobin is what you have when you're a baby, and you have fetal blood, um, adolescent blood, and adult blood. So you have too much fetal hemoglobin. So the levels of S blood, which is the sickle blood, is lower. And then around six months old, your feet hemoglobin drops. And then that's when, if you have sickle cell, it will kick in, it kick in quite strongly. Um, and so like one of the treatments that, in fact, the only licensed treatment for sickle cell is a drug called hydroxy, which the, it, it's supposed to increase the level of fetal hemoglobin in the blood. Uh, but it doesn't work for everybody. It's like the Marmite drug. It's one of those things that either it works and works well or it just does not. I tried it, it didn't work. It actually made me need to clean it, which meant that I had um, a zero immune system. Um, so, yeah, I was one of those unfortunates where my sickle cell kicked in very early. Okay, so just tell me a little about your parents at the time. Um, and I believe it wasn't really well known um, back in that time. No. Not saying that you're an old man. <laughs> yeah. No. But at that time, it wasn't really well known about at all. So tell me about your parents. Mm. So um, from what I can get with my parents, especially my mother, because um, when they obviously took me home and she just told me that I cried all the time. And I just seemed to be in pain and they could never um, find an answer as to what what was going on, so they took me to the GP, they took me to different doctors, no one had an answer. Um, and so when they finally got an answer at the hospital, and it was tough. Um, and I do remember being young and going, having to go back and forth to the hospital, and I spent a lot, an inordinate amount of time in hospital. Um, and it's strange, when I was younger, I would spend, be in hospital for short periods, so I'd be in hospital for say two, maybe three weeks at a time, but quite often. Um, and as you get older, I tended to be in hospital for longer periods that spread out, if that meant, makes any sense. Yes, uh, yes. So the gap between each, each uh, admission spread out. But yeah, you know, being young and in hospital, especially at Great Ormond Street, especially back then, where um, and you, you, there weren't many of us. Um, and so one of my childhood friends, I've known my entire, probably the, right, the person that my parents, I've known the longest, also went to the hospital. Um, as I said in the video, lots of us that grew up there and moved over to usage um, when we were adolescents uh, are no longer here. Um, so growing up, you, you just get used to being told that your lifespan will be this, your lifespan will be that. Um, and and they, you know, they would tell your parents, but they would tell it in earshot of you, so you hear this. Thing. And as, wow. you don't understand what that means, so... And, and, it, and it kind of, um, it helps form your attitude to life. So if, if you grow up with someone always telling you that you'll live in every amount or anything, or you're going to be dead by a particular age, you have one of two ways to live your life. Either you just give up and curl up in the ball and just let it happen, or you fight and you, you become almost aggressive because the pain... And especially a child, pain is something that you can't get your head around. You, 
you just have no idea why you're in so much pain. And simple pain in its simplest form would be, imagine someone taking a hot, red hot poker and stabbing you through your back repeatedly. A jagged red hot poker. At the same time, someone else took a metal baseball bat and beat every part of your body from your head to your toes and smashed all your bones. Um, then stomped on you after they'd broken your bones. Then told you to get up and do a marathon. Um, then do a marathon with a bag over your head. Your breathing is impaired. And all the time, still inflicting. And the, and the level of pain and it inflicts gets worse and worse. That's sickle cell. Sickle wow. cell is, most pains have a cutoff point where it gets so bad and it stops. Sickle doesn't do that. It just keeps going. It just keeps getting more and more intense to the point where the same where it's like the silent scream. If you've been in pain to an intense way, you cannot even scream. It hurts to, to breathe to scream. So you go through the motions, but nothing comes out. And you get that. I sort of like in the rest of the way, if anybody's seen the Godfather, where, Godfather, where he just screamed and it wasn't a sound. That's what it is. The pain is that intense. And knowing that it's going to get worse is an odd sensation. And no matter how, no matter how many um, doses of morphine or pain medication they give you, nothing, and I mean absolutely nothing, is going to take that pain away. It's going to take wow. maybe the edge of it and the sharpness and some of the intensity, but it's never, ever going to take the pain away. And then there's only so much they can give you without killing you. So yeah. you you put up with it and you, you deal with it and yeah and it yeah. and it shapes and in, and it shapes your life and the type of person you are. It definitely shapes the type of person I am. So so tell me something then, just going back again to your school and college years, how did that affect you? Oh school. Um school you I didn't spend much time at school, so and which is why often people sit so get labelled as stupid and sick, because they didn't understand, or they didn't understand, or fail to understand, and it didn't. They can't see. They look at you, and you look fine. It's, it's a it's a saying I hear. I don't know how many times a day. Oh, you don't look sick. You look well. And you try to explain to someone at school, a teacher at school, that you're in pain, and that you can't do a particular activity, or there's a reason why you can't read a book, or you or why you're not at school, or why you've got so many hospital appointments, um, or why you've been away so long. So growing up, when I was younger, I used to just tell people, I went away on holiday, you know, my parents travel a lot, and, and they just assumed that you were stupid, and you, they didn't understand it. It's not because you, you weren't capable of learning, but if you're not there, and you miss what the other children are learning, you haven't learned that, and they then don't take the time to teach you that, so you're having to play catch up on your own. Yes. Which, yes, which yes. is a huge problem. And and it carried on through college, uni, and it just, yeah. It, no one ever makes an allowance because it's not something that they can relate to. If I said to them, I have cancer, they can relate to that. That's immediate. They, they perhaps know someone's got cancer or had someone with cancer in their family. It's sickle cell. That just goes over their head. I'm reminded of uh, something you had mentioned before in our, our pre-talk um, at St. Clement's Primary School um, wow. uh, and in regards to the behaviour of our teachers or your teachers, should I say, yeah. in, in the classroom. How did that happen? Yeah, so I was born left-handed. I'm right-handed now, but I was born a lefty. Uh, back then, uh, in the particular school I went to, you couldn't be left-handed. It didn't because, you know, you wrote in a particular way. And so they had, um, I don't know if anybody's ever seen those big tailoring rulers, those big 60 heavy wooden rulers. And the teacher would stand behind me, and every time I picked up a pen or pencil, it would hit me on my hand. And would just keep beating me on my hand, on my left hand, to the point where my hand swole. And even if I was tickling and in pain, and me being me, I was incredibly stubborn. And didn't understand why I could not write. 
with my natural hand. I just could not pick up. I wasn't allowed to just pick up the pencil or pen with the hand of my choice. And so they would just keep hitting me until I couldn't physically pick up the pen or pencil. So I was forced to write with my right hand and did that every day, every lesson until I became right-handed. Um, wow. So, you know, when I tell people that you're a left, I'm a left, they say, how come? And they say, yeah, that's why I'm a left, I'm a right-handed. That's when I supposed to school. just wasn't, yeah, being right-handed. And they didn't care the fact that I was already in pain and I had some pain in joints in it. That, that didn't matter. Whether, and then winter, whether it got cold and, and the cold affects me even more and I was even in more pain, it didn't matter to them whatsoever. It was just following their rules. And that's why I became right-handed. Wow. And then going into your secondary school now, um, as you mentioned before that, you know, you spent a lot of time in hospital and yeah. not really much time in education. But just going to your secondary school, talk about that to me, please, about uh, your education and exams and stuff like that. Mm. Secondary school was, uh, was similar. And before I go on, if people are wondering why my parents didn't do anything about it, the school, me being here, I didn't tell them. Um, I just refused to tell anybody. I just dealt with it my way. It made me angry, and I just kept it. So I just didn't tell them. Um, and so starting secondary school, um, they were obviously told that I had this issue um, and I had an illness. How much they understood that is anyone's guess. But I went to a secondary school, um, fairly strict all-boys Catholic school. Um, and some of my teachers were nuns and priests. Um, it was a good school. And... You know, we've had a lot of opportunities, but in the same way as primary school, they didn't make allowances for the fact that I was unwell. So if in the summer it got really hot and I would go and, and I would say, I need to go and drink and I have to make sure I drink plenty so I don't become dehydrated and sick, I wasn't allowed to do that. Um, in winter, it didn't, you know, if, if the wind passed from windows open and it was freezing, no one bothered to close the window and say, are, are you are you okay? Um, and the same thing again. And I think halfway through secondary school, I stopped hiding or making excuses for the fact that I wasn't at school a lot. But I told people I was sick and explained them what it was. Those that wanted to hear, and those that understood, understood. And those that didn't, didn't. But that wasn't my concern. And I, I could see my attitude to life and that stubbornness and anger sort of fueling the way I was. Um, and I would play every sport imaginable. You name it, rugby, football, boxing, martial arts. I would do everything. If you told me to climb Everest, I would climb it. I would pay a serious price for it, but I would do it. Because one, I was incredibly stubborn. Two, I was told I couldn't do anything. The, in the video, it mentioned where I did the half marathon. Um, I was told I had to do a half marathon, I, and I was actually unwell at the time, and, not, and it only just come across for about a week or so before. I said I couldn't do it. Um, and they said I would be suspended from school, so I did it. I ran the, I ran the half marathon, ended up in hospital, really unwell. Um, and when I came back to school, um, my school's teacher actually said to me, it wasn't that bad then, was it? The fact that I ran a marathon, he, the fact that I'd been in hospital for weeks, went over his head, he was just saying, you know, the fact that I didn't, it wasn't that bad. As if I'd been making up the fact that I couldn't, I shouldn't be doing this marriage. Um, and that was the sort of pervasive attitude where people just didn't understand and, and it carried on. And the same with how you learn. Um, I was particularly good at certain subjects, religious education, uh, English history. And I like to learn. I love to learn. You know, and one of my premises in life, I have to learn something new every day. But playing catch up and then having to deal with being sick at school is hard work. And especially as I didn't take any pain relief. But the entire time of school, while I was at school during the day, I never, ever took anything for pain. Not even so much as an aspirin. And no matter how bad the pain got, I never took anything for pain. One, two. Because it would make me drowsy. And two, because I was incredibly stubborn. And, you know, you get a bad reputation of being hot-headed and being 
quick temper. To a degree, that was, uh, that was probably, they were probably right. But no one ever said to you, what, ask why you were like that. And yeah, it's, it, it, it's, you know, it's like we, at school, we had corporal punishment as well. And so we went to a really like, we had corporal punishment. So you'd either get six of the best on your hand or 12 on your bare behind. And I never once made an excuse that said, I can't, you can't punish me. Because I was sick. I would take my punch and send everybody up if it was just. You um, mentioned about being in hospital as well, um, whilst you was at school too. Yeah. Um, and how how did that transpire when it came near your exam times? Being in hospital, that's, it, it, it acts like from when I was a child at school. So when you're in hospital as a kid, as a child, you're supposed to have teaching. They're supposed to teach you at the same time and have classes. In a great almost street. And for whatever reason, whether it was a colour of my skin or I don't know, they just didn't like me. I never had a single lesson in hospital. Not one. I would what I would lay in bed and watch the other children in the corner being taught by the teacher. And was never once, not ever, invited over. So secondary school isn't a thing. Never once given help. So you'd have to play catch up by yourself. You'd have to study by yourself. I took, I took exams in hospital. I mean, if you're on a, drip, a morphine drip, and someone says to you, and I'm in hospital, so they never made any, sort of, any allowance and said, okay, you shouldn't be taking this exam now. Wait till you get to that hospital. I took the exam in hospital. It would fail it because half the time I wouldn't be awake and because I'd never, I hadn't studied. But then we'd have to then retake it when I got out of hospital and pass. Because I knew I wasn't stupid. Regardless of how many times they labeled you as stupid, I knew I wasn't stupid. I knew that if I worked hard and I'm only that I will outwork anybody. You yeah. set me a challenge, you're not gonna outwork me. I will work until I collapse and then still get up. Mm. And wow. it's so, that part of thing with the education system where it doesn't even though people say it's gotten better now, but it doesn't make allowances. It doesn't help people. It doesn't understand why someone may not be able to do something sometimes, even if they, they look particularly well. They, you know, people still make you incredibly tired. So you can have like peak control where one moment you're, you're feeling great and you're running around like everybody else. And then literally two seconds later, you felt as if you run 10 marathons and you have no energy, zero. You see me, where you just dip and there's nothing I can do about it. Zero. And then it's the same with pain, where I, I'm in pain all the time to a particular level, and I can deal with that. But then occasionally, it will just do up. So you, you add that to the fact that there's extreme fatigue and all the other issues that come along with it. And you have to then sort of say, yeah, deal with it. And yeah, that, that, that's, that's, that's not a very nice experience, especially when it comes to education, which will set you up really for life when it comes to career and work. So just going into work then, um, how did that affect your work in life? I mean, how I've, did you I've even never, work? <laughs> I've, never, I've never quit a job in my life. And I've had more jobs than most people. I mean, the record is seven in one year, two in a day. Um, and I've never quit a job. Um, I started working... Um, when I was, I actually wasn't even quite 15, 16 yet, and I lied about my age to get a job in a supermarket. Um, second shelves, the same, I remember, same as a supermarket. Um, and then I was going to go to college, so I wanted to work. I'm not a lazy person, so I started working, and every job I've ever had, I have been fired because I've been off state. You know, I could understand it. if I wasn't good at my job, incompetent, or did my job badly, Fine. You fired me because I was sick, something that I couldn't control. And I told you about. I was always upfront and honest and explained to every employer what it what I had, what it entailed, the fact that I would have um, lots of hospital appointments. Um, I would be off sick for a period of time because I was in hospital or unwell at home and two unwells coming to work. It didn't always mean I was in hospital, just unwell at home. And every single employer, I mean every single one fired me because of that. 
Um, and people say, you know, why didn't you take the tribunal? And my attitude was, well, if you're going to be so callous as to fire me, it's because I was sick, not because I was not good at my job. I didn't want to work for you. I never had a problem getting the job. It was just keeping it. I remember telling you earlier where I think one of uh, one of the most brazen companies I worked for a um, city bank. Um, and, and I was there for several months, good job, and, had, and, I, and, I, and I hit a good streak. I, didn't, I hadn't been off sick once. I had not, not been off sick for months and gotten really well and enjoyed my job. Um, and then I woke up one morning and I was in, I was in agony the night before, but me being me, not wanting to be in hospital, not wanting to miss work, tried to sort of See, how, see if I could stunt it out and, and go to work, but I couldn't. And I ended up in hospital. Remember, I ended up in hospital at nine o'clock that morning. And at nine thirty, my mother had called to tell them that I was off sick. My boss at that time came to see me with another member of staff from the office. I was blown away. I, I was like, wow, this has never happened. No one has, you know, other than my me, has ever visited my hospital. It just doesn't happen. Um, it brought flowers and a card and they sat talking to me for two hours two hours smiling joking telling me how wonderful i was and then got up and said oh we've got to go back to the, back to the office and i thank them for coming and you know and and, and we're so appreciative that the fact they they gone out the way and made this time and as they walked down the corridor i opened the card that they gave me and it was a big card and across the middle it said you're fired and as I read the card, my boss turned around and said to me, don't worry about your stuff, we'll send it to you. Oh my gosh. And left. That, um, that must and, I looked been... at the, and, I, and I kept looking at this card and I'm like, wow, I've been fired a lot of ways, but this is the most talent. He just said, literally said, you're fired. And the fact that he had sat talking and laughing and joking for two whole hours, knowing that he was going to fire me. I and mean, this is literally half an hour, and I'd not been off sick once the whole time I'd worked there. I think it was like six months or something like that. Not been off sick once. Yeah. Uh, um, which is um, which is not unusual. Which, his way was unusual, but the fact that I was fired and everybody said to me, "You should take them to a tribunal. You should sue them." And and I just thought, no, because I actually don't want to work for you, and I don't want anything from you. If if you're that callous. By me, not because I was a problem, not because I was bad at my job, but because I was sick in hospital. And you sat talking to me, you saw me in pain, and still fired me the way you did. You didn't want anything from me, nothing at all, not a penny. You didn't want your nothing. So I let it go. I got another job. Wow. So that must have been heartbreaking for you, though. I mean, I understand what you're saying in regards yeah. to, you know, if they're going to behave like that, then you don't want to work for them anyway, which is understandable. Yeah. But really, what did that do to you? And I know at the time, did you, uh, I think you had uh, seizures as well, apparently. Is that right? As a, another yeah. conclusion. Um, actually, the seizures yeah. came after, a little while after that. Okay. Being, I think it was the way in which they did it that um, was particularly callous. So I said that I'd been fired from lots of jobs previous to that. Um, but they'd always said, oh, you know, gave me the reason, you know, okay, we hate to do this, but we're paying someone else to do your job whilst you're in hospital. We can't afford to take two people, so we're going to have to let you go. And you hear that, and you know it's coming. It's a, it's a well rehearsed speech. But they were particularly callous. And it made me take myself that, you know, not want to work for someone else. That I always wanted to work myself and, and do my own thing so that I didn't have to put up with stuff. Because the fact that you have to explain yourself, where, like I said, if I had cancer or anything else, anything else, that would never have happened. Mm. They wouldn't, they wouldn't have dared do that because it would have, people would have been, you know, oh, you, you fired someone who's sick. Mm. But it's that same thing where sick or it doesn't matter. It's like there's a saying we had, um, I see. I sort of came up with this slogan when I was like 4 30. Um, pain is what it pain is what the patient says it is, unless you have sickle cell, and then it's what the doctor says it is. 
Wow. Okay. okay. So, and it's like that, the same attitude with education and work. They don't understand it. They can't empathize. They don't know anybody or they think they don't know anybody. And if I sat down and said to them, I guarantee you, you know someone with sickle cell. You sat next to someone with sickle cell today. Yeah. Two of the, along with thalassemia, two of the world's largest genetically inherited illnesses. Only thing that affects more people is cancer. I guarantee you, you know somebody with sickle cell. Or you've met someone, you shook hands. But it means nothing. Yeah, and that's that is quite shocking where you have something second to cancer in the world, so to speak. <laughs> And it's not really recognised. No. That is really shocking. That is shocking. I, mean, mm. I think it's the way in which we're perceived, and, and the way society perceives. You know, you only see someone in pain or or drugs, and it's a drug tag. We're we're junkies. We're drug people. That's it. You know, I've been called a junkie to my face by a doctor in an open ward. The doctor stood stood face to face with me and called me a junkie because I wanted a prescription. Wow. And no. felt comfortable doing that. There's no other illness on earth where a doctor would feel comfortable. In front of an entire ward for the people calling a patient a junkie. He's not a junkie. Mm. You know, I take medication because I have to, not because I want to. And I don't, I don't. You know, I don't know. I don't know any sticklers, you know, sticklers can have problems being um, building up a, um, a, um, a dependence on medication, if you, like anybody else. But I don't know any sticklers are walking around junkies and shooting up. I don't know any. You know? Um, it, it, but it's that pervasive attitude of where, because we don't understand, we don't see you as, as equal to, so we're okay to do what we do because if, if you know if you mistreat someone with sickle cell, no one's going to get fired, no one's going to get in trouble for it. If you mistreat someone with cancer, multiple sclerosis, or any other thing, it's huge. Someone someone loses their job. Papers are interested. Parliament asks questions. You can mistreat an entire ward of sickle cell patients, and no one bats an eyebrow. No one would say anything. In hospital, the, one of the favorite tricks they used to like to uh, do was bed moving. Where if someone comes here, oh, sorry, uh, a patient that's come in, they need your bed, we're going to have to move you to another bed. I think the worst one, that happened to me 12 times in one day. 12 the times? Worst, the worst, one o'clock in the morning. One o'clock in the morning. I got up to go to the loop. In hospital, came back to find my bed gone, Drip, gone from my room. They had moved it into the corridor, and the nurse had packed my stuff. But it by the way, said, "Oh, sorry, we're going to have to move you to another ward." One o'clock in the morning. Wow! So that's a lot that's, that you've been through in that respect, yeah. Yeah, and, it, and it's and and that's partly why we often get tagged and labelled as being difficult or or aggressive. You explain to someone, okay, you have to deal with pain that would bring everybody else to their knees. Pain that you couldn't possibly imagine at levels that there's nothing to do with. Uh, you know, if you, if you sat and pulled, and pulled my nails out with pliers, okay, I'm being honest, that wouldn't yeah. come close not even close. You know, I've had leg ulcers and a sickle tap at the same time. Leg ulcers, when it's as superior as that, it's like being, it's, you get the same treatment as first degree burn. First degree, it, it, it's nothing. There was no skin, no flesh, no bone. I could see bone. And I had a crisis at the same time. But yeah, I still have to put up with other people's attitudes. And then them thinking that I'm the one with the problem. Right, right. And you're going through that pain. Yeah, I'm thinking, walk in my shoes and tell me I have, I have an attitude. You know, there are, 
I said that in the video, I said, if sickle cell were a person, it would be convicted of war crimes. And it would be. Um, some of the things that have been done to, to me are criminal. Not just me thinking it, they are criminal. Um, and especially when I was a child and younger. Um, when I was what, seven or eight, um, I developed um, osteomyelitis, which is an infection of the bone, where your bone sort of dissolves and it's, it's a serious infection. And it eats my bone. And I developed it in my left arm. Um, and needed an operation to drain it and take that needle to cut away the dead bone and, and fix it. Um, and this, this was at that almost street. And I remember uh, being prepped for the operation um, and then giving you a few meds and whatever else and going and being wheeled into self activity. Um, but not going to sleep. And no one seemed, you know, I'm a child, I don't know. No one seemed bothered that I wasn't asleep. But proceeded to operate. And the first time they put the scalpel on my arm, I could feel it. And I said, I could feel that. And they said, oh, it's just your imagination. You're awake. So they proceeded. And I said, I could feel it. So they cut open my arm. Here, yeah, here. Yeah. Then took a drill out and drilled out the dead bone. And I could feel everything. And because I said I tried to stop him with my other arm, they got four nurses to pin me down. Did an entire operation. I was awake and felt everything. Wow. I took a drill, a drill to my arm. Okay. And I won't even, I'm not even going to say on him what they called me. Right. The one, but I refused. And it is mainly because I refused to cry. And I wouldn't call out. I refused point blank to call for help or to shout or to even shed a single tear. Nothing. Mm. Yeah. So, and so they just. Did the entire operation and closed it without any medical, without any medical, without any. Anesthesia or anything. So there's no, ex there's no explanation at all in regards no. to what they did there no. at all. No. no. And then well, I, had to, but then I had to then have several operations. My arm was stuck in this position for years, so I had to have repeat operations. Yeah. But I still wouldn't tell anybody. Mm -hmm. Just because me, really. Yeah. yeah. So obviously going through all of that in your your school life, your working life, uh, you must have come to a point where you then said, OK, enough is enough. Yeah. I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to yeah. have to be sacked from another job within that same year or week yeah. anymore. Yeah. So what did you decide to do then, you know, um, when you no well, longer growing worked? Up, growing up, I always wanted to be a musician and I love music. Absolutely loved music. I remember my brother um, always wanted to be a musician, play in a band and form our own band. But it was because my father said to me when I left, when I was about to leave school, to, he didn't consider being a musician a proper job back then, which I understood. And he said to me, get an education, go to college or uni, get a qualification. And he was correct because at least you'd always have that to fall back on. And in particular, in my case. So I did that got an education, got qualifications, then went to work. Because of constantly losing a job, eventually you say enough is enough. And yeah. so I said one day that after being medically retired from work at the Islington Council, I would, I would just pursue my dream of becoming a full-time musician because I was already doing a writing for other people and creating beats and things like that. So I just did it full-time and was really lucky and got to work with some amazing people. Um, and one of my full-time writing partners at the time was Ronnie Jordan, the jazz musician. So Ronnie Junior, we wrote me, we wrote music. Um, yes. stuff like the audio dynamite, Precious Wilson, 
I suffered as well. You, you name it. And I've got to do some amazing things. And that was what I put my heart and soul into. Yeah. Just like yeah. music. And it was and it was like my way in writing and music or poetry was my way of expressing out all of that stuff that was inside. Okay, because I've never felt sorry regardless of what's been done to me or what I've gone through. I've never felt sorry for my day in my life. Not one second. Even so they must have called... sorry. Can't continue. Sorry. Go ahead. Even when they've left me in pain because they wouldn't give me my pain medication, I've never felt sorry for myself. And it just makes you more determined. Like, you know, the active, no matter how many times you fall, get up. You keep getting up. Mm. Wow. So 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 <laughs> it's you threw yourself into music, as you say, yeah. okay, and because that was an outlet for you, you were able yeah. to kind of manage it, if that's a want of a word, so to speak. And I know it developed some kind of fine your bones anyway yeah. to do further campaigning, just to make people aware and stuff like that. So just talk about the stuff that you're involved in now, really. Okay. So once I started doing that, um, and because I was determined that people growing up and no one would have to put up with the things that I've had to put up with. And the others wouldn't have to deal with the, the, the stuff that I've had to deal with. So I started, um, I set up a, a, um, with some others, a, a support group called Red Cells Are Us, um, based at the Camden Lindsay Sickle Cell and Thalassemia Centre, which, along with myself and others, we helped to get. Um, and we've got our own building, our own facilities where we, sickles and thalassemia patients can come, get help, and just have a place of their own. Um, and help doing as much as I could within the sickle cell community, helping to work on the sickle cell standard that went through Parliament, which defines how sickle cell patients are treated when they're in hospital, and helping to set up all groups within hospital, and just doing anything I could to, to raise the profile of sickle cell, because it's the lack of knowledge. The fact that something that affects so many people can go under the radar, and why the things that are done are able to be done. Similarly in racism, if no one speaks up about it, it just carries on. You have someone in the office being racist and the rest of the office says nothing, it just the perpetuating goes on and on and on. Yes, yes. And yes. it's the same thing. So I was, so being someone who's not afraid to speak my mind and, you know, being fairly vocal, and like I said, I have a really good understanding of sickle cell infection. An unbelievable understanding of how it affects you. Um, and my family, I've had to put, and, and that's the only thing that I ever regret in my life. The fact that I caused others hurt because of having to watch me. Yeah. You know? And so I was determined to to do whatever, and I mean whatever it took to make sickle cell and thalassemia more known, raise awareness, raise awareness to a blood donation, make sure that the fact that in within the black community, don't donate, don't donate blood or organs. And, and to have an illness that affects us predominantly, and yet it's even with our community, it's silent. You know, you speak to people and they, they want to eat. You know, I said it is, as far as it is, I know people who deny that they have it. Deny that they have it and they're told to deny it, not to tell anybody, not to make a big deal, keep it hush hush. So therefore, it perpetuates and people don't donate blood and people don't raise awareness because they don't want to be seen. They don't want to be, have that light shone and they don't want to be seen as less than because there's a stigma. And it's like the word disease. I don't like the word disease. Yeah. It carries yeah. a, this, a stigma, and mm. it, it was often used as a weapon to put mm. someone down in the same way other words are used to keep people of color down. Okay, so you're involved in a lot of things like you know, red cells yeah. are us, and you sit quite high on, on the board there as well in NHS. And so, just talk a little, about, a little bit about the work that you do in regards to those particular forums. Mm. Okay, so with red cells are us, I'm the chair of red cells are us. Um, and like I said, I was, uh, the reason why I set it up is because, like I said, I wanted to help and, and, and get sickle to help themselves. Um, 
and have and to do it in conjunction with NHS member staff and nurses and doctors who have a passion for helping people with sickle cell. Uh, and I set up a welfare fund. Um, and the idea of that is where you raise money and if you have sickle cell housing, you're a member of our group, our organization, and you need help paying your, your rent this week or just having money to do your food shopping or your mm. benefits. Mm -hmm. You can come to us and get a 0% loan. We will lend you. Yes. Well, yes. We'll lend you hundred pounds, hundred pounds, two hundred pounds, and you have you have a few months, three months to pay it back, no interest, so that we can then help the next person. Yeah. yeah. And that was my riding passion to help as many people as possible, um, and to keep helping people and to keep raising the the bar as to how we're seen and for the and, and how we're put out there. Along with other organizations like Six Thought Society um, and others who, wait, if you raise a profile and it's seen on the media and, and people feel comfortable raising um, funds for it and doing events and telling people about it, people's perceptions change and it gets more help and people who have it don't have to put up and tolerate right. the things that happen to them. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, we're, and on the member of the HBC, which is which is part of uh, the Macmillan Cancer Trust and it's a cancer charity, but it also supports and helps red cell patients. It buys machines, self-separated machines, when we have exchanges. It provides um, teaching for nurses who come and specializing in red cell patients. And so if you've got out and sit on the board, this is part of the hospital I go to, and I'm more than happy to do what I can to help on that. And so doing that as well and do what I can to again raise the profile. Yes. Um, yeah. And partly why I ended up joining Deposit Fire in the NHS criminal. Brilliant. Yeah. So talk a bit about that and what your experience was in regards to Britain's Got Talent. I know there's a hand up. I've, I've noticed a hand up. But we'll, if you just, just go into about that and, and, and okay. how that raises awareness about blood donation in terms right, of so, not just singing, but. Mm. Yeah. So joining the fire, because of what I did with Red, what I do with Red Cells or us, HBC and others, uh, it was one of the matrons, the nurses at the centre. Um, obviously, he's known me, and she has known me yeah, for a very long time. I wasn't even at her age either. Um, and she, she said she's seen this, uh, this advert on this flyer on, on the NHS site asking for uh, singers to set up a, a sickle cell fire. And knowing that I'm into music and sing, she one you go along. Thought about it for about five minutes. Said, yeah, great. Went along, kept yourself, Colin, conditions, got in. And as I say, the rest is history. And one of the reasons why I felt and do feel passionate about the fire and what it does is one, that it was raising awareness of blood donation. Well, this was the NHS and other people coming together in a way that they had never done before to bring up the profile of two things that matter to me dearly. Um, and, and also I could give back. It's my way of saying thank you because, you know, prior, like I said, prior to having an automated exchange which is on the machine, I used to have five units of blood every single week annually. Um, and now I'm down to 10 units of blood every three to four weeks automated. And it was my way of saying thank you and giving back and also linking up with the NHS and, and showing people really that because you have sickle cell, it doesn't mean that you can't achieve, you can't do anything. You, you're, you're the poor me. I don't feel sorry for myself. You know, I, you know me, I run around like a headless chicken some days. Some days I don't. Hmm. But what, how you see me, I'm like this 24-7. At home, out. That's who I am. You know, there isn't two of me. This, this is how I am. And joining the fire was is an an unbelievable opportunity. And then the fact that we were then asked uh, to do the mobile, war, yeah, which I thought, wow, the mobile. You know, this is a national war. We get to go one thing because I get to control two passions. I get yes. to sing, which I can't explain to people. It. It's the most 
It's the most joyous thing you could possibly do. And you see me. It doesn't matter how much pain I'm in. Oh, I yeah. to get up and sing. I will sing and sing. And it's it's such an emotional and it's, it's an unbelievable rush. Mm -hmm. You know, I've stood up and stood next to you and I've been on it and I just thought, Jesus, I really do not feel well. Wow. I'm almost in tears because I'm in so much pain. And the second, and I mean the second the music has started, I'm like, wow, this is this is it. I get to let go of all of this. I get to do something with it. I get to put all this this rage and this this hurt. I get to do, put it somewhere. And not only do I get to put it somewhere, I get to show people yeah. that this is why it matters. This is why sickle cell matters. Because I'm up here showing you that it matters, that I matter, and that we can, and, and to raise that profile, and to raise that bar, and not just, I, I'm not just happy to go up there. I want to sing and sing well. You know me. I want to <laughs> sing, and, 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 and I peg myself against the best things in the choir, which you are one of them, most definitely. And I say, until I get to that point, I am not going to be happy until I pass, I pass you. So I give it my all. And I've, and I've come off stage and barely walked and had the biggest grin on my face. I had like the biggest smile and been happy. Yeah. I remember we, um, loser. I could barely move before that. Mm. I sat backstage and, and I was like looking at everybody and I'm like, I don't want to let people down, but I'm really hurt. And I did, and I couldn't take any morphine because mm. morphine affects my muscles and how I breathe. So when we when we go out and then time I think I take nothing for the day. Right. Zero. So I and so the pain level by the time we get to sing if it's an evening, it's high. So I'm fidgeting and walking around. And when we're at Palooza and Colin asked me, do I want to go on? And I went, yeah. And I've got on that stage and be second. And I mean be very second. The music starting off my mouth. What pain? <laughs> you know? And it, it was strange. Like, when we finished that, it was like the best time ever. Just being around the rest of the fire and doing what we do. It was like, unless you've been there, I can't explain to you. It's, it's like watching your child being born again and again. It's that kind of high. But I left the hot, I left when we did the gig and came home and had to go to the hospital. Mm. Yeah, but I would do it again and again. If you had told me I have to do it again, I would do it again and again and again, without thought. Yeah, and that's why the fire and the message that we give, where getting people of color to donate to us and seeing how important it is. That's why I did this film because you have to understand that it's not just a case of making me feel a little bit better. That keeps me alive. That makes me able to see my children. I have grandchildren. If I still pinch myself. My son's 34. I still pinch myself. But I have children. I get up and I will call him on ridiculous hours of night. Just and like, wow, I've got a son or I've got a daughter. And, I will, and they say like, what's wrong with you? Like, how old are you? And then I still <laughs> pinch myself that I have children. It, I mean, yeah. like I said, if when when I was at school, if someone had said to me, a eighteen was like, what is that? I couldn't even imagine living that long. Right. So to still be here, that, that's why I I get up with a smile every day and think of ways that I can make myself better, make life better for others, and enjoy what I do. I I love life. You know, I'm Brilliant. the biggest. In the world, I will drive my grand. I will run my grandchildren ragged, <laughs> <laughs> and 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 that the quiet and what it gives, not just for what it gives me. It's the message it gives. Because like I said, people are people come up to you and say, oh, "I saw you doing this. I saw you on Britain's Got Talent. You guys were amazing." But then set, follow up by saying, 
I had no idea what Tikka was or how bad it was beforehand, but I actually went and, and looked it up. And then I actually then registered to become a donor. I have lost count of the number of times I've been in the fire where someone has said to me, I have become a donor because I've seen you guys sing yeah. on mobile, print or talent, Westminster, wherever. All the things that we've done. And even I said, I have picked up a huge bucket of this. Travel. I had never traveled, never left the country in my life. I had two passports that I'd never used, never been anywhere. People said to me, oh, I, oh, I don't get to go hold it. I'm like, oh, what's that? I've never been. I enjoyed the one. And I have, I have traveled three times. Twice this year, been on a plane. Do you know how cool that is? <laughs> you get advantage and something as simple as saying you go on holiday, something that people take for granted, they say it without thought. They, they plan it without thought. They think, I'm going to go and do this without thought. If, if that thought is something that doesn't enter your mind because you've never been well enough or because you couldn't get insurance, because no one can ensure you to go to get on a plane. You don't think right. about it. The fact that, you know, I did, it's like, you saw, I kissed, when we went to Boston, I kissed the ground and did yes, it. Yes, I saw you. Outside the <laughs> airport. People were like, look at me like, what is wrong with that man? I did a jig outside the airport, up in the air, dancing and kissed. You think I was a folk boy? And people look at me and I'm like, my first time traveling. <laughs> hey, and then like as they sort of scuttled away and thinking, okay, there's something wrong with him. <laughs> like you know, things that people take, little things like that people take for granted means an awful lot. True, very true. Wow. Is and this... why I I'm doing what I'm doing with such passion Wait. because I I am getting as much as I'm giving out. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I want yeah. others to see it. I want other signals to look up and say. You know, wow, yeah, mm. this is what I should be doing. I don't want you to, to lay in bed and thinking that because someone said you won't live this long or you won't live that long or you can't do this, you can't do that. Do it. Do yeah. not listen yeah. to them. Pay no attention to people that tell you you cannot. Okay? Even if you become unwell, you've done it. I have laid in hospital in agony, with a grin on my face. I said, why are you, because I was, I was thinking about all the stuff I'd gotten up to before I was in hospital, and the stuff that I'm going to get up to the second I'm out. The very second I'm out, I'm going to do something. Yeah. Wow. That's been just so absolutely inspirational, Calvin. Um, and like, like, I mean, I do know you, and I do know some aspects of you, but I had never heard the, the deepness um, till now, basically, on, on, on what you had to live through. It's been told, I mean, if we've got clap hands on, on teams, we just have to kind of ex express our gratitude in regards to what we've heard today, I tell you, it's just been absolutely amazing. Absolutely. Absolutely. You salute you, sir. Wow. Mm. <laughs> it's uh, the first I've heard applause on a team call. Absolutely. <laughs> 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 and I'm being honest, this year, I don't consider myself special. I really don't. Mm -hmm. Okay. I honestly do not consider myself special. Okay. Yeah. But what I am is unbelievably determined. Yes, yes. I have zero, zero fear. There is nothing on this earth. Wow. Nothing. You put a gun to my head. Nothing that frightens me. The worst thing that happens to me in life is that I die. Absolutely. So how are you going to scare me? Mm. So it's like live. You should. Live and enjoy. Be the best person you can be. Okay, and inspire others to be the best that they can be. Yeah. You know, walk the walk. Mm. You know, I said, I said to you earlier, I, I walk the talk. I will not tell you to do something that I will not do myself. Right. If I told you to climb Everest, 
I am next to you, climbing Everest. Okay, is wow. you know it's important that people see that do you walk, do you do you get up every day. I get up really early. Most days I, I go to bed like three, four. I'm up by five, six. I only sleep like five hours a day, and. It takes a lot for me to just sit still and not do nothing. Mm-hmm. Every day I get up and I think, of, right, what can I do? What can I learn? How can I improve this? How can I make things better? How can I improve myself? Yeah. How can I make life better for people like me? How can I say to someone, okay, you know what? You should be, you shouldn't be sitting back and, and feeling so slow. Because you never, you never want to be one of those people when they get to say in middle age or get to a certain point in life and say, you would have, could have, should have. I wish I'd done that. No, do it. Everything, and I mean everything in my life that I wanted to do, I've done. And the things that I couldn't do were out of my hands because I was unwell. It doesn't bother me. Honestly, it does not bother me. I am doing stuff now that if you'd have said to me 10 years ago, one, I wouldn't have thought I'd still be here. And two, there's not a chance someone said to me, you went, we sang in Las Vegas. I walk down Las Vegas Strip. Do you know how cool that is? You know, I mean, I mean, like I said, you know, the simple thing like women on the plane, me taking a picture of every toilet on the plane, and the student saying to me, why are you doing that? Because I've never been on a plane before in my life. This is the first time ever. It was a double day. So I, I went, you're taking a picture of every toilet? Said, yeah. Why? Because I've never been on a plane. He really did. <laughs> so I took a picture of every, and I got a round of applause from the from the the passengers, and they were like, and I videoed them, and they thought like, this guy's off his rocker. But if you've never done it before, you take it for granted. Something like going to the toilet, someone took that for granted. I'd never been to a toilet on a plane. I'd never been on a plane. You know, I've been in a position where I said when from where I've been paralyzed, and I had C two pilot, I couldn't move, I couldn't feel anything. Okay, I'm a grown man, and I had to depend on someone to wipe my behind. Apparently, I couldn't feel it. You know, I'm like simple things like that. People take for granted just to be able to get up and do things. So, like, yeah, the, like the choir has been unbelievable, and the fact that other than singing, the best part of it. Is the fact that people see sickle cell, people that yes. wouldn't have seen it, see it. Yeah, people that, that wouldn't have easy. asked questions, ask questions. They, 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 you know, if we do wash your blood type with the NHSPT, where we go out and risk people and get their blood type, and they ask questions and they say, oh, the, hair, the hairstyle was different. And they say, oh, you're the guy from Be Positive. You know, and they will sign up. I don't even have to, they will just sign up. You know how cool that is. Mm. There's nothing, no amount of money can buy that. Yes. No and apparently, you save three lives with each giving unit. a pint of blood, correct? Yeah. yeah. Each unit mm. saves at least three lives. Yes. So I have 10 every time. Do you know how many people I have to thank every time I have blood? So every time I get up on that stage, sing, I am leaving everything there. Wow, yeah. amazing. Amazing. Great. So okay. what we're going to do now, Calvin, if you can just stay on a little bit longer for us, please. Absolutely. I'm going um, away. <laughs> okay. Um, we've seen Rosalind uh, Fox's hand up for a little while. So you want to unmute yourself, Rosalind, because we'll take some questions if you need. And I've seen some questions on the actual chat too, um, and can probably take a couple of those as well. So, uh, Rosalind? Hello, Calvin. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Hi, how are you? Oh, hello. Um, Calvin, can I just say, I, I, this subject is very close to me because I have two very close friends who also suffer from sickle cell and I've seen one in the hospital who is very close and the doc- doctors like them say you haven't got a chance of survival. And I think one of the things that I've seen sufferers who f- suffer from sickle cell is the dogged determination and the stubbornness to fight whatever the um, medical profession might like to say. And that is something I am so uh, inspired and um, really uh, by that sort of determined strength because it reminds people 
that you know there are things you, we can p complain about but that's not one of the the normal everyday things is not something that we should do so uh, i say hats off to you kelvin but the one thing i i really wanted to ask you about this uh, uh, because it's so close to my heart one of the, the research i did look through because of the way the medical profession was really quite stubborn or not not that they're stubborn but obviously limited in terms of resources one of the things the clinical trials that we're looking at were hematopic stem cells transplantation. Okay. And over that, there's 1,200 clinical trials that have been reported, and then there's a 90% survival rate yeah. in terms of event-free. Was that something that was ever considered and offered to, to people like yourself? Because I've seen they use that for people who suffer from very severe immunology like sickle cell. Yeah. Um, the, the reason there's only 1,200 reported is because, of course, with the problem with the donor from BAME or, or from family, it has to be from a family and usually flushing of the, of the bone marrow to flush out so you have healthy cells in return. So was that something that mm -hmm. you ever looked at or, or something yeah. that you can campaign for sickle cell? We have, I have done, um, where the one of the programs that you're talking about where I've spoken to people who, who are on these programs and who run these programs. But the problem is that it's a criteria. So you have to be unwell, but not too unwell. So you have to have quite, for them to qualify for that, you have to be, have a lot of issues and had lots of things and been in that hospital a lot. I wouldn't qualify because I'm too unwell. So I probably, I wouldn't survive the process. Um, so it, it's, it, I think it's a, it's, it's a really good piece of research. And I think that more, it needs more publicity. It needs more eyes being shone on it and more work being done. And, it, and, and if it can help people, anything that, that alleviates sickle cell, I'm all for it, as long as it's not harming us. Um, and as long as we're not being used as guinea pigs. Because in the past where there have been some treatments and we felt like guinea pigs, really, where I've been on drug trials and whatever, and you, you, you do get to feel like a guinea pig and you think, no, I'm not going to do any more. But this is promising, but it's the criteria and the fact that someone like myself wouldn't qualify because of that. You know, I'm sick enough to get on it, but too sick, if that makes sense. It's crazy. Uh, oh. yeah. But do you find that more Bame people are coming now out uh, um, as uh, donors to try and help or do you think that's still a problem as when you're campaigning it's still a huge problem um i remember at the beginning of Dubai when we first did and uh, we started doing a uh, british Got talent and if i remember i think the the percent rate was 1.5 percent uh, back in the community people actually donated organ donation is a lot less than that um and there's lots of reasons behind that and historically reasons um, and we're trying to, and that's one of the reasons why the fire exists and why we work with NHSBT to raise and to, to give you more education and to put more information out there and to break down some of the myths and the stereotype of, you know, people ask you, what do they do with their blood? Well, they give people like me. And you tell them that each unit they give saves it through at least three lives. Or if they do donate, it's getting them to come back. I don't realize that the buds use it has a shelf life, so you need to come back. You don't just register and give once, you need to continue it for as long as you can. And it's just breaking down some of the, the, the problems within certain um, Bay communities that is the issue. Um, had religion in there, lack of knowledge, um, even to the point where I said where people are told to hide the fact that they have sick themselves. So, if they're being told to hide that they have to talk, the people who are telling them can't be the ones donating because they don't want to associate with it. It has a certain stigma within certain communities. So seeing people like myself and the other members of the choir and, and all the other warriors that go out there and, and they set up groups to raise awareness. And and what would help if we see more public figures? So so you have quiz shows and you have people that are going on there. And I'm not saying that they shouldn't go on these shows and raise money for whatever. It's, that's their choice. But I've only ever seen one celebrity <laughs> on a quiz show and raise money for sickle cell. It just doesn't happen. So if you had people 
and it was seen as a norm and it's seen as something that people would raise money for, would put money into research for, would go on TV and talk about more more often. And it's not seen as um, an abnormality or you know, like exotic. It, it was seen as the norm in the same way cancer is or and other breast cancer, testicular cancer and everything it helps or any, any other illness you can think of. Once we're in that sort of camp, it becomes easier. The problem is we're outside of that box. Yeah. So funding for treatment and just the way we're discussed doesn't happen. Right. Okay, so we've just got another question here as well. Thank you very much for that question as well, uh, Rosalind. All the um, best, Kevin. Thank you. Excellent. That's a good question. Okay, so we have another question on the chat, and this is: uh, Does every warrior experience the same symptoms of severity or treatment? Uh, no. Um, sickle cell, you, you're either a carrier, so you have a, a trait, um, and there's two different types of trait. Um, and then if you have sickle cell, there's two types of sickle cell: there's sickle cell SS, which is what I have, right? and there's sickle cell SC, which is full blown sickle cell, but a slightly lesser form of it. Um, and even with people who have SS, if you had 100 people who have sickle cell SS, not everyone is going to have it as severe. Um, some people have certain muscles and very rarely go into hospital, have crisis once in a while and don't have much pain. Other people are at the opposite end of the scale. So just because someone has sickle cell, it doesn't mean that they all are going to have it to the same degree uh, and have some of the same issues. Um, as a male stickler, there are, there are problems that I will have that female stickers will not have, vice versa. So, prior prison um, mm. is an issue. Um, leg ulcers and things like that, which stickler stickler ulcers, both male and female, but again, you know, it depends on the severity of, of your stickle and also how much time you spend in that hospital and how often you stickle and how severe it is. Because, you know, people can be in pain. And it not, it, you know, because I, I have a score chart from one to ten. So anything below six, no matter how bad the pain is, I'm staying home. If it's above six, I will contemplate going to hospital. It has to be up in the eight or nine consistently for me to actually get there. And whether you keep there or not is another conversation. Um, so that's the problem. So not everyone's the same, and everyone it affects slightly differently. Um, yeah. So there's a huge range. That, and that also influences how people see us within the healthcare system. Because they see someone and say, okay, well, this person has sickness or whatever, and they don't have this problem. Why is it that this person is screaming and in such agony when this person doesn't seem to be in as much agony? And the fact that they're not taught that in the medical training is, is a problem. But then you have to explain to them these are the reasons why. You can't sort of lump it into one basket. Okay. And there's another question as well attached to, uh, I suppose, in the into regards to symptoms. Now, um, can symptoms be alleviated by choice of food, lifestyle, or climate? I know it, it affects people differently, doesn't it? So that's a question that's been asked by Claudia Hamilton. Okay. So sickle cell is a genetic inherited illness. So you're born with it. Okay. So no amount of changing your diet, diet will improve, diet, exercise and your climate will improve your health generally as it would anybody else. Um, and so if you're healthy and you look after yourself and you eat well, of course, if you, if you have crisis or you have issues, you're going to deal with that better and it may not impact you as severe, but will it change it? No. Right. Absolutely mm -hmm. not. There's nothing on earth nothing no no remedy no climate that's going to stop you from having a crisis if that crisis is going to happen if you don't have a crisis if you just don't have a crisis that's it some of the other Ill problems you have like i said it varies i have iron overload um, because of the blood the amount of blood and the way your body stores it so it, and my body cannot get rid of that so i have to take drugs to try and get rid of that at the moment i mean the average I live for an average man of my age, or male, between um, 150 and 350 units. Mine is 4,000, 4,500. Um, wow. Yeah. 
and then other problems as well. So it, it, food and diet and looking after yourself and dr drinking, staying hydrated is probably the one way because as simple as we need to drink. So I, I try to drink anything from three liters maybe a day, maybe on a hot day even more. I, I have water with me continuously. When I'm out and about, I always have some drink. I'm just drinking yeah. water. I don't, I don't drink alcohol because I just don't drink alcohol. Right. Um, but alcohol can cause you to become dehydrated, but that's not why I just don't drink. Okay. So just a, a last question before we bring Grace, our chair of MBCPA, who is an inspiration herself, <laughs> I might add. Okay. Um, one uh, question from Kate Brown. Um, uh, asking about your experience and, and it's about employment and stuff like that. It's obviously horrifying, horrifying, should I say. Um, she just wants to know, okay, how do you think employers um, can best support staff who are warriors or sufferers of sickle cell? Mm. Okay. Firstly, to adhere to the to, um, Race Discrimination Act, Disabilities Act. This Disabilities Act. Mm. Means that you're you're supposed to be they're supposed to if you have a, a six hours of disability, it's a recognised disability. So that means that they're supposed to put things in place to care for you. I have worked for employers who have I work for business council who medically retired me regardless of their policy in place. And so if the law and the system made sure employers adhere to those rules and laws and protections, it would make life a lot easier training um, where an understanding so if you have someone coming to work for you that has to go stop understand that having them in a freezing cold office is not good it's going to make them unwell have them in an office that's way too hot and not ventilated it's not going to not going to be good for them allow them to have plenty of time to drink during the day and have breaks so they're not just sitting at a desk and not moving around um, and if they don't know that there should be somewhere an organization that they should go to and seek information because there are plenty. Sick Society, for one, is an organization that can provide employers information on how sickness should be treated and the things that they should sort of be aware of. And if the sickler themselves understand and know they're about their illness, they can inform their employer. And what we can do, we can put. We can put the Sickle Cell Society website up as yeah. well, um, so people can gain information from there. Because I think there's a plethora of information in regards to that, isn't yeah. there, Calvin? On that. And then the same in education, change the, the 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 sort of the mentality and the the thought process that you can you can just do whatever you want. If if the culture was different, so if the culture within education and school is different towards the existing. Sicklers wouldn't be considered sick and stupid. Sickler wouldn't have to take an exam when they were unwell. Same as employers. If the culture within employment was different, and same as the Sex Relations Act and, and Discrimination Act and, and things that we all know about. If that was put in place and and more promise was given to it, and the penalty for this for, for ignoring that was adhered to better, employers wouldn't feel so able and willing to just discriminate against people sick cells. So if you went for a job, and the second you said to yourself, and always, and I think, well, people cell patients should always, always tell an employer that they have sick cells. Because if you don't, and, and you become unwell, they have the right to fire you on the spot, mm -hmm. and you don't have any legal recourse for that. But if you inform and tell them, they cannot do that, or shouldn't be able to do that. So <laughs> if those things were put into place where, um, Employment was made, the, the environment of employment where people sit with or anybody that has an illness that affects them in that way, where employees, once you know and you say, okay, I'm learning, I've agreed to employ you for your skills, regardless of whatever illness you have, for your skills. And as long as you do your job properly and you're competent and you do what you're paid to do, they shouldn't be allowed to just fire you. And, and do it in such a way, in such a callous way. Like I said, I've been fired in ways that you couldn't imagine. Um, and never once, because I wasn't good at my job. No one's ever said to me, we're getting rid because you just broke the job or that I could accept. You know? 
no, no. not once that happened. So it, we, we need to change the culture of the fact that in the same way education, that they're not able to just do what they want to do and there's no recourse. And the fact yeah. that then if it does happen, there should be things in place that make, uh, make the person able to then go back and say, no, you know what, I was dismissed unfairly. It wasn't because of my work. Because if you couldn't fire someone who's uh, someone who got pregnant and had to take how many months off their pregnant, or because they got into a car accident and were horribly injured, you know, if someone was stuck in hospital in, in traction for months on end, wouldn't employ even think it wouldn't come to their mind. So I could be in hospital for a few, another like me could be in hospital for a few weeks, and employers and say, sorry, I'll let you go. So that needs to change. Oh, thank you for that, um, Calvin. Um, I'm going to ask um, uh, our chair, Grace Ronfrew, to come and give a closing remarks and responses as uh, if she needs to in regards to what she had heard today, because I know I was blown away and I actually know you. <laughs> um, so, so I'm going to introduce now to, to those who's attended today's session um, to our chair, Grace Ronfrew. Thank you very much, Calvin. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Grace. Calvin, uh, good afternoon. Thank you so much for your presentation. I think personally, I've been so humbled by your strength of character to survive despite what's going on, all the chaos going around you. And I just really admire that. And you've given us all something to think about. I think the, I know a lot of, I have a lot of family and friends who suffer from sickle cell disease. And I personally was not aware. I've never heard the account you've given about how it, what it's like to experience it. I, 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 to be honest, I've always, I've not realised how serious it is. And, you know, I, it's shocking and terrifying, actually. So I just want to thank you for having the courage to come and share your story with everybody. And I'm hoping that we will all go away with, with a better understanding that will spread the word about raising a better understanding of what sickle cells about. We will also donate blood and encourage each other to donate blood and support each other in the community that have this ailment. I'd like to end on thanking you so much for your time and sharing you. your story. I'd like to thank Conrad as well. Conrad is so passionate about this issue and I'm so glad that this event has come to pass because we've been trying to arrange this for a while now and it's and it, we need to do it again as well we've done it once we're going to do it again <laughs> for people who missed it i'd also like to thank our members for supporting the event and wanting to know more about sickle cell i'd also like to thank finally all our special guests and people from outside of the cps who tuned in we thank you so much for your support so um conrad I um, just want to say thank you to everybody and I hope everybody will have a good evening and as you leave here that we you know we have some co quiet contemplation about what we're going to do about this issue in our own little way to raise awareness. Very, very powerful presentation. Like I said, we have to say it again, very short. Yes, people have, some people have missed it. They don't realise the significance and important of the, importance of this Definitely. Uh, presentation. Thank you so much, Calvin. Thank you. And I'd like to thank yes. you all, the CPS, all of you. Um, doing this was an honour, absolute honour and pleasure. Um, and I told Conrad, he, there's nothing he could ask me to do that I would say no. Zero. There's nothing he could ask me to do that I would say no. Um, and the fact that you, you you wanted to do this and you put so much effort into it and made it such a, a an, an enjoyable experience means more than you know. It means an awful lot, and it's truly, truly appreciated. It really oh, Thank you, Calvin. Thank you so much, Calvin. It's very powerful. Um, you know, I'm trying to hold in my emo. I felt like weeping when you were describing what you've gone through, especially the stuff in relation to cruelty at school. And it's something I take for granted when my kids tell me a teacher has bullied them. I kind of just shrug it off. But actually, there must be so there might be so much more deeper oh, no, no. stuff going on that. I'm thinking, oh my God, maybe I, I ignored something really serious or trivialized it. So I would have to, you know, ask my kids to, to explain, you know, what, 
what was really the issue about the teacher or what happened at schools. So thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. Excellent. I had forgotten to say, and I do apologise to those, I know some have left already, that the session was being recorded. I should have announced that at the beginning and, and didn't do so, so I do apologise greatly for that. But it will be recorded, and I think some people want copies uh, that had to leave early in regards to it. Um, I know Calvin knew it was being recorded as well, so it's, it's uh, something that he was aware of. Thank God for that. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. And Thank you. Might, might adding, there was a notice at the top of the screen to say right. a recording had started. The recording yeah. has started. But <laughs> hopefully people will, uh, it, it's, it's wonderful we're recording as well, so people can actually see, people who missed today can see what Calvin had to say. Very, very moving, very powerful, very humbling. I'd love to come back and do it again for you. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to get you around again. It's, it's so important, even for our HR teams, which we need them to be aware of this illness, that the way you present it, it, it really helps people get a, be a better understanding of how it affects people. Yeah. So thank you. Anyway, I better let you, I better let you go, Cav. I know you've, um, <laughs> we've, we've, we've had your, you know, your, we've had you for such a long time. I know you probably want to get to your dinner or something, but thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. And thank you for supporting the event. Bye. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Well done, Cal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, you. thank, you. thank right. you all for coming. All right. Bye. See you then. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Oh, well, thank you. We forgot to thank um, Kate. Kate, thank you so much. We really wow. appreciate your support. I'm do sorry. Yes. Please forgive I us. At short notice, too. Yeah, yeah. that's all right. Thank but it's mutual support because so it's fantastic, absolutely fantastic. So thank you both, and thank, thank you to you. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Oh, Conrad, well done. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. It was insightful. That was so inspirational. It's very yeah. emotional as well. It's it's hard to fight back the tears of. Yes. Life. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and it just brought me back really because I remember those times when we were singing on stage. I think we went to do a, a BBC event once as well, and I remember you can kind of see on his face like a kind of blank look, but he's still really putting all his energy oh. into it. Yeah, um, and you know that the pain he's going through. I mean, he says it's constant pain every day of his life. Yeah, yeah. yeah. One's eggs and things into context. You realise that we don't uh, appreciate what we've got sometimes. Yes, yes, yes. Is, um, complaining and moaning without, especially our, our physical.